and that somebody will use one of these nuclear weapons in a conflict or perhaps even by accident. Now, most people I talk with in the United States say, oh, the United States never used nuclear weapons first. But the fact is, it is our off-stated policy by the Secretary of Defense, by our own president, that we will not hesitate to use nuclear weapons first if the situation requires it. And that's worldwide. This symposium will bring into sharp focus the reality of nuclear war. We hope that an accurately informed public sensing this threat to its survival will follow its instinctive aversion to communal suicide. We cannot afford to repeat our past for, as Einstein said, the splitting of the atom has changed everything save our mode of thinking and thus we drift toward unparalleled catastrophe. Until recently, I thought that the medical realities of a nuclear war were generally appreciated. That seems not to be the case. Many people, including some in high office, appear to be unaware of the facts or at least to have suppressed thinking about them. If we remain silent, and thereby permit that lack of understanding to continue, we risk betraying ourselves and our nation, making almost inevitable, either by design or by chance, what could be the last epidemic our civilization will know. Now, how much is a million tons of high explosives? A million tons of high explosives would take a train 200 miles long to carry it. That's how much a million tons is. A million tons of high explosives have enough energy in them to melt one, 1 1.6 as a matter of fact, million tons of ice and make it steam. That's the kind of energy we're talking about. That's the kind of, of, of energy that would be released by a single weapon. And we have lots and lots of weapons, both we and the Soviet Union, that have explosive yields very close to one million ton of, of, of TNT. For one week after the explosion, you will have to abandon an area 33,000 square miles. For one month, you will have to abandon an area of 23,000 square miles. These are enormous areas. New York is about 40,000 square miles, New York State. So you have to be prepared to abandon land of this enormous magnitude if you don't want your people being contaminated exposed to radiation. Now what's going to happen to this people? Where are they going to go? Here we're speaking only about one weapon, but in a nuclear war, you're not going to get only one weapon, you're, you're going to get at least a few hundred, if not more. Therefore, the notion that you can have civil defense that will protect the po population to a degree that will make it possible for them to survive in these areas is rather far-fetched. Now, the National Academy of Sciences felt quite sure to state that if you have exploded simultaneously in a very short period of time, 10% of the weapons that would be available in the arsenals of the Soviet Union and the United States by 1985, this simultaneous explosion will create enough nitrogen oxides to take out 70 to 80% of the ozone layer above the Northern Hemisphere and 30 to 40% of the ozone layer in the southern hemisphere because we assume that all this explosion will take place in the northern hemisphere. 20% depletion of the ozone layer will allow enough UV light to come to Earth that will blind all unprotected eyes. Now, we can all wear glasses, but the animals and the birds and the insects will not wear glasses, and they will all be blinded, and they will all eventually die. I can think of nothing else more of, of a more massive ecological dislocation, if I'm going to use a mild word. The entire 
ecosystem will collapse. Because if you don't have insects, for example, to pollinate the flowers, you won't go and get fruit, I mean, things like that. The whole thing collapses. And that's what's going to happen, most probably, if only 10% of the weapons in the arsenals of the two superpowers in 1985 were to be exploded within a few days in a nuclear war. Sometime later in this decade, military plans, which are being seriously discussed now by the military establishments on both sides, would uh, lead to the, a counterforce exchange of something between 10 and 20,000 megatons each. There would be lethal fallout covering the entire United States and essentially the entire Soviet Union. Worldwide, this would lead to, let's say, 20 radiation units per capita everywhere on Earth. And this, I regard, would regard as a situation which we would all have to consider to be absolutely intolerable. We have to recognize that beyond a certain point, more weapons are ridiculous. Let me give you an example. One or two Poseidon submarines could destroy the Soviet Union as a realistic society. We have a total of 31 of those weapons, about 20 of which are on patrol at any time. Arms control negotiations must be given the highest priority and linkage to less central issues must be minimized. The MX missile itself is a very, very dangerous weapon from the point of view of our security and the security of the world. Because the MX missile system, the 200 missiles with 2,000 accurate warheads, is designed specifically to have the capability to threaten the entire Soviet ICBM force and ICBMs are 75% of their strategic deterrent. Deterrence is the name of the game, and it must be mutual. Both sides must be confident that they have a deterrent, or otherwise we get into an unstable situation in which there are pressures to launch a first strike. The first and easiest thing they can do is to put their weapons on a hair-trigger alert. It's known as launch on warning. Their warning systems, their radars, tell them that we have launched an attack and uh, then in the 15 minutes that they have a warning they can get their missiles out of their silos and on their way and when the missile warhead arrives all it does is hit an empty silo. But it is terribly, terribly dangerous. And it's not just terribly dangerous as far as the Soviet Union is concerned, it's terribly dangerous for the United States. Because what it does mean is that we are depending on computers and radars and other technologies to tell us when we should start a nuclear war. And frankly, I don't want my future and I don't want the future of the world dependent on the question of whether a computer malfunctions or not. We've seen three cases in the last year in the United States where we had actual nuclear alerts due to malfunctions of our computer systems for our strategic uh, weapons. My life has been spent in uh, planning for both conventional and nuclear war. Well, the governments of the United States, France, Great Britain, Soviet Union, China, are today planning, training, and equipping their forces for nuclear war. We have some 30,000 nuclear weapons. 10,000 of those are targeted against the Soviet Union. Soviet Union has 20,000 nuclear weapons. 6,000 of those are targeted against us in the United States. The other countries have about 1,000 altogether, the British, the French, and the Chinese. Altogether, just a little over 50,000 nuclear weapons in the world today. A lot of people think that, gee, just because we've got 300,000 troops in Europe that we don't need, to rely heavily on nuclear weapons. That if we spend more money for our conventional forces, that somehow we can move away from nuclear war. Well, I'd just say that uh, uh, that uh, simply is not a valid point. 
We have nuclearized our conventional forces. All of our conventional forces, our army divisions, our air wings, our navy ships are all nuclearized. 70% of our navy ships carry nuclear weapons. One of the reasons this arms race keeps going, and perhaps it's just from my own perspective, is that military men honestly think they can win a war, a nuclear war, any kind of war. And we have to think that way. That's our business. We don't go into this business thinking that we're going to train and equip and use our energies to have some kind of a draw, to have things come out even. So we're constantly asking for more powerful, more accurate, more destructive weapons that can be fired more rapidly so we can get the jump on the other fella and win the war. I had a, a uh, television, uh, Marzana television program last week in New York City with General Graham. I asked him, uh, I read his book, which he just published, uh, and I asked him if his book didn't really say that yes, indeed, you could win a nuclear war. And he said, yes, of course. Now, General Graham was a former deputy CIA. He uh, was a head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, and he's a top Reagan advisor. The question that I'm going to address this afternoon seems a straightforward one. What will happen to San Francisco? in the event of a specified nuclear attack. What will happen to its people? What will happen to its physical environment? What will happen to its biological environment? What will happen to its structure of medical care? Hiroshima was 12 and a half to 15 kilotons. At one megaton on San Francisco or any other population center, we are trying to imagine 70 Hiroshima bombs all at once, all in one place. In only one respect, it seems to me, does the balance between we have just seen and that of the problems we are discussing today tip in a different direction. The people at Hiroshima, as you saw and heard, had virtually no warning. San Francisco or Detroit or Moscow or Leningrad can expect from five to 15 minutes warning time. We are dealing in short with events that because of the lack of precedent may be specifiable but almost unimaginable. Yet, as I hope to show, there are those among us who have imagined concepts of survival and survivability that are demonstrably false and misleading. Let me turn first to the specifiable events. A single explosion, an airburst at 7,000 feet over downtown San Francisco in the fall on a clear day, a working day, let's say a Monday, in dry weather at about 3 o'clock, in short, let's say today, now, at this moment. I draw your attention to the map. Uh, that first circle, this is for one megaton airburst, remember, with a radius of about one and a half miles, is an area in which the overpressures are 20 pounds per square inch, which will destroy everything. Winds are 500 miles an hour. Uh, reinforced concrete and steel buildings of the strongest construction will either collapse totally or have all of their floors swept out from within the structure. Uh, the heat is such that most everybody will be either vaporized or killed by third degree burns if indeed they're not killed by uh, other trauma. Circle two with a radius of three miles has overpressures of 10 pounds per square inch, winds at 160 miles an hour, Brick and wood frame houses destroyed, and suppose people seriously burn. And I'll just mention uh, one thing about overpressures of anywhere from a half a pound per square inch to two pounds per square inch. It'll take a glass window and turn it into a thousand particles of glass traveling at an excess of a hundred miles an hour. As a nuclear bomb explodes, a huge pressure wave initially traveling at a speed greater than that of sound spreads out from the center of the explosion followed by winds at speeds transiently exceeding 500 miles an hour. The winds create a low pressure area as they move outward. Surrounding air rushes in, fanning the many fires started by the thermal radiation and initial blast damage. One can expect these kinds of fires for a radius of anywhere from 8 to 16 miles, depending on the megatonnage. Firestorms of this type, aside from Hiroshima, developed after a series of conventional air raids on Hamburg in 1943, Leipzig and Dresden. They produce temperatures estimated at 800 degrees 
centigrade, 1,472 degrees Fahrenheit. Days after the raid, as some shelters were open, enough heat was found to have remained so that the influx of oxygen caused the entire shelter to burst into flames. What a firestorm does is increase the lethal area of a nuclear attack for a single bomb fivefold. A more important point in terms of some dreams of civil defense planning and the like is that in Hamburg and Leipzig, the only people who survived were those who fled their shelters, not those who entered or stayed in them, because the shelters simply turned into crematoria at those temperatures. At one megaton in an airburst, of the 3,613,000 people in the San Francisco metropolitan area, 780,000 would be killed outright. The total casualties are 1,162,500 people, almost precisely every third person. We have never, in the Western world at least, excluding Hiroshima and Nagasaki, had an event in which every third person was killed or injured and in a matter of very short time periods as well. Let me turn briefly to the types of injuries you have already today heard about, uh, some of them. Uh, overwhelmingly, first of all, third degree burns. Certainly thousands, probably tens of thousands in the case of the multiple 20 megatons ex explosions in the hundreds of thousands. And that of course exceeds by thousands, by orders of magnitude, the total number of burn beds in the United States, let alone in the San Francisco metropolitan Bay Area. Second degree burns, of course, on top of those. Crushing injuries due to the collapse of buildings and related kinds of trauma. Ruptured internal organs, especially rupture of the lungs. Penetrating wounds of the skull, the thorax, and the abdomen because all kinds of objects have been turned into missiles traveling at high speeds. Simple and compound, compound fractures of all kinds, including skull fractures because people have been turned into missiles traveling at high speeds until they hit the nearest hard object, wall, or whatever. And of course, hemorrhage. And of course, all of the above in combination. And two things that aren't mentioned very often, significant numbers among the wounded survivors who will be deaf because of ruptured eardrums, and even larger numbers who will be blind Anybody within 35 miles down as far as San Jose in the south, well into Marin County in the north, 35 miles to the east, who makes a reflex glance at the fireball, and there will be many such people at distances up to 35 miles, has a very high probability of being blinded by retinal burning. In the Marshall Island tests, indeed, animals were found as far as 345 miles away with focal retinal burns. And the 35-mile figure is a conservative one. But again, to talk of response becomes a kind of absurdity and a kind of delusion, again, when we look at the data. Who will respond? And what will they have to respond with? Physicians and hospitals, as has been mentioned, are destroyed at rates greater than that of the population because they tend to be concentrated in downtown urban areas in the zones of highest lethality. And it is a conservative calculation without taking you through every detail that there would be less than 2,000 physicians in the San Francisco metropolitan area, the area that we're talking about in terms of the population base, able to function. If every physician spent only 10 minutes on the diagnosis and treatment of each patient and worked 20 hours every day at one to a thousand, it would be eight days before every injured person is seen for the first time by a physician for 10 minutes. But there is a further dimension in which this estimate is meaningless because it is taught to talking of physicians or other health workers working without equipment, without diagnostic aids, without laboratories, without therapeutic resources, without blood or plasma, without caches of blood supplies, or any of the other things that are needed for contemporary medical management of trauma, burns, or even uh, lesser injuries. So the effectiveness of that 10-minute diagnostic and therapeutic visit uh, is likely to be almost zero. You must remember that there will be no electric power. There will be no water. There will be no transportation system. 
most of the buildings and streets and geography and terrain will be unrecognizable. There will be no organized systems of communication. And I remind you, in the scenario we are describing, there is no probability of help from outside. What this means, in sum, is that most of the seriously injured persons will never see a physician or other health worker, even for the simple administration of narcotics for their pain, before they die. And it seems to me highly probable that the survivors will envy the dead. The only true meaning of survival in complex urban industrial societies is not mere biological survival. It is social survival. The biological survivors, in fact, have all pro in all probability merely postponed by days, weeks, months, at most a few years, their deaths from secondary attack-related causes. And life in the interim will not be anything like life before a nuclear attack. Then there's a problem that's not looked at very much or very carefully. There will still be 300,000 to 500,000 human corpses, not counting the animal corpses and the like, 300 to 500,000 human corpses. Again, an event unprecedented in human experience. One can assume that most of those 300 to 500,000 corpses uh, will simply decay. San Francisco area, what is left of the San Francisco area and its surrounds, would thus become a mausoleum. The possibility, many of you will already have recognized, of epidemic disease in this situation uh, is enormous. Some conclusions. There is no survival in any sense of that word that has social meaning from a nuclear attack. The only hypothetically effective protection, construction of deep, thermally insulated blast shelters with independent oxygen supplies for a large fraction of the urban population would consume more than our total annual governmental budget, perhaps as much when we got through doing it for everybody as the gross national product for several years, and in any case, merely postpone death because it would fail to resolve the ecological consequences of all-out nuclear exchange. Mass evacuation provides no rational basis for planning for survival. I testified not long ago before a Senate hearing at which the successors to that set of Office of Civil Defense Mobilization people, now called the Federal Emergency Management Program, uh, testified and they said cheerfully for a specifiable nuclear attack that they already had plans that would take care of 7% of the population and if they were just given enough funding and a little time they could work out plans to protect up to 80% of the United States population in the event of an all-out nuclear exchange. One of the senators asked them what technique they had in mind. They answered mass evacuation, of course. And they were asked how long notice would they require to effect such a plan successfully. And they said, only eight days. <laughs> it is my belief that any physician who even takes part in so-called emergency medical disaster planning specifically to meet the problem of nuclear attack, any physician who even takes, place, takes part in such an activity is committing a profoundly unethical act. He is deluding himself or herself, colleagues, and by implication the public at large into the false belief that mechanisms of survival in any meaningful social sense are possible. But there is a positive responsibility as well as that negative one, I think, and that is the obligation to assess these data, to inform, to instruct to take advantage of the experience that has given us, individually at least, as part of our work, experience with death, to be active in the political process with regard to these problems, and to make clear what as physicians concerned with healing our data are and our views are. And I feel increasingly urgent about that. I think the time is limited. I think the responsibilities that we face are awesome. I welcome your participation in this conference. 
as a first or continuing step in the assumption of those responsibilities. Thank you. Governments were formed, in fact, in the past to protect the health and well-being of the societies. They worked in conjunction with doctors to provide clean water supplies. They worked together to provide adequate sewage, and in that way we eradicated much disease which was rampant throughout time. Governments must therefore work with us to eradicate the most serious problem the world has ever seen, nuclear war, which is medically contraindicated. This is the ultimate medical issue of our time. It is the ultimate medical issue since man has been on Earth for three million years. We are all adults, not children. We therefore inherited the Earth as our birthright, each one of us. Each one of us can be as powerful as the most powerful person on this earth. We can blame nobody else but ourselves. We must take the world on our shoulders like Atlas, as physicians and as mature adults, and work towards this ultimate question. For no other issue really matters. It doesn't matter if we immunize it babies so they won't develop pertussis and tetanus. It doesn't matter if we give them good nutritious food. It doesn't matter if the marital relationships are good so the children grow in an emotionally secure environment. When you look at the concept that maybe over the next decade, these children that we are working to nurture, protect and love will be dead. As Dr. Geiger said at the last conference, there are not communist children, and capitalist children, they're all children. You just have to look at a baby, the beauty of a baby, to know what the symbol of life should be and what every single one of us in this world should be working to protect the babies of this world who will pass the gene pool on to future generations. These weapons are biologically totally unacceptable they must be eliminated medically, they are contraindicated. And this too is the ultimate religious issue. For what is our responsibility towards God to continue this process of wonderful evolution that we know as physicians is, which has taken billions of years to happen? What is our responsibility to continue that? If war my profession I'd be trained to imagine the worst each day I'd envision destruction and calculate the way to strike first if all my talents and energy were spent trying to tear life down how could I nurture the beauty of peaceful trust world round we're standing at the crossroads and if it's war we choose sweet mother earth and each of us will lose so let us build a garden Hope and love shine through Sweet Mother Earth Sweet Mother Earth Sweet Mother Earth We have not forgotten you